Welcome everyone, this is April 8th, Lessons for Full Spectrum Humans, and I'm beginning class with the level two material because my um, untidy internet link kept kicking me off last week, and I didn't get a chance to speak about some of the essential concepts that I really wanted to impart. What I experienced when I went to Mount Shasta and some of the things I learned about Agartha, and also the concept of the I am God circuit, which um, correlates or relates to this idea of ascended mastery. And that's why I have pictures of the galaxy prepared for me back there. So the first is this personal experience, this anecdote that I had when I went to Mount Shasta. So I used to live right near Mount Overlook, literally like less than a mile away. And that mountain is first of all the portal that I came through into this world upon. I didn't, I didn't get my things right there, but Mount, um, Mount Overlook is where I went in 2003. So I walked into this body in 2001, but there was a period of overlap and adjustment where I did not have like full ownership and I didn't have the steering wheel of the life and the consciousness of this body. And that moment didn't happen until I went to Mount Overlook in 2003. And I didn't know what I was looking for. I just knew I was looking for a magic mountain and people you know, eventually led me there. And Mount Overlook is a manifestation portal. And just like on your body or on the chakra system right back here. We have chakras. Those are the major energy centers or vortexes of energy on our body. And we also have minor chakras, like there are uh, major notes and sharps and flats. Uh, we have minor chakras in between and minor nodes. So it's very similar to the acupuncture meridians on the physical human body. Mount Overlook is one of the smaller vortexes. Uh, they're very powerful places to go and meditate because whatever you are feeling and whatever you have in your imagination emanates and is magnified and amplified. So for example, in 2012, on December 21st, I hiked up Mount Overlook and I planted my world seed, my accumulated you know, ball of hopes and dreams and desires of what I would like to experience in the future. And um, so Mount Shasta, I bring all of this up about Mount Overlook because Mount Shasta is like the real deal is Mount Shasta is one of the major chakras of the physical form of the planet. I've heard various um, connotations. I understand it to be the crown, the violet chakra up here. Different people describe it in different ways. So Mount Overlook back in Woodstock is a beautiful, special place in its own right. And it is a smaller emanation or reverberation of this much larger mountain. So that was one of the first impressions was that when I went there, I thought to myself, Mount Overlook is like the starter kit. It's like my little vortex, you know, the child size kit. And then you get to Mount Shasta and there really is a, a energy presence there. It kind of feels like, you know, like a big, like pulsing, high pitched presence. And when there's a, a small town like kind of at the base of the mountain sometimes you might be turning a corner in the town like you turn the corner to look for the cafe and all of a sudden there's this giant shining white mountain there just going Wah, and it can definitely uh throw you for a loop and so there's an energetic um penumbra a area of influence and where i live near fortuna i'm hundreds of miles away from the mountain itself but i'm within the mountains area of influence and when I was driving to the mountain, I had similar experiences to when I would go to visit Mount Overlook, which was almost always a spiritual pilgrimage. I almost always went there with some intent, like some question that I needed to ask the universe or ask for something or express something to the cosmos. And I would always have a lot of internal dialogue, like when I was driving up towards the mountain itself. And that was when it's like when you put your jewelry into a sonic 
jewelry cleaner. It gets reverberated and it reverberates off all of the accumulated detritus. All of the smudges and schmutzes that get stuck on the beautiful jewels get reverberated away. And when I would go to Mount Overlook, by the time I actually made it to the mountain, most of my internal dialogue would have reverberated away. So in this experience going to Mount Shasta, first when I went, I went to the hot springs that are in the town nearby that is called, oddly enough, Weed, and had a wonderful experience. I highly recommend it to anyone who is visiting the area because it's a purging like if you have ever been to the sweat lodge in Inipi Lodge, this is a, a preparation for ritual because it helps you to let go of your sorrow and grief and anything that is weighing heavily inside of you so that when you go to the manifestation portal, you are manifesting from a place of joy and unconditional love. So this is one of the main teachings you know, that I teach about cultivating unconditional love. We need to cultivate at this level a beautiful whirling vortex of energy that our throat, our communication, our insight, you know, being able to understand beyond words and our connection to the divine all sit on top of that whirling vortex of energy at this level here. So going to the hot springs first, First of all, when you sit in the mineral water, it has a purging effect. If you cannot get to a mineral hot springs, you can do a similar effect by getting yourself a really hot bathtub full of water and adding Epsom salts. Um, the so salt itself, and we'll get into this as part of the longevity and energetic, um, energetic hygiene teaching, salt itself has a purifying effect. So sitting in a bath full of salt water has a purifying effect on your physical body and your non-physical body. So at when I was sitting in the actual tub of mineral water, which is very, very hot, I felt a lot of purging of uh, lower vibrational emotions and um, definitely did some crying. This is all release, release, release. And then there's a sauna there, and I went into the sauna, which is the size of a living room. It's the largest sauna I've ever had the privilege to go inside of, with a giant, enormous, you know, um, um, furnace in the middle of, for, for wood to heat it all up. And the place is lined in wood, and a lot of the wood has knot holes in it. It's like knotty pine or something like that. And the effect feels to me like a lot of eyes like you see all of these knot holes all around the room. And it really felt to me like these are sacred witnesses. These are the ascended masters that are in telepathic contact with you and watching you um, and uh, witnessing as you are preparing and letting go of anything that doesn't serve as you're ready to go into the next level. So after I did, you know, cleansing and purging and there's even a plunge where you can jump into an icy mountain spring I spent the night, you know, um, camping out or sleeping in my car, and uh, I had a lot of telepathic contact with the Ascended Masters. I got a wonderful inspiration for a new piece of artwork, and in order to make that, I needed to buy a new piece of equipment. And so when I said thank you for these things, the message that I got was that this was all inside of me, like all of these ideas were there, that it was just necessary to connect the dots. And this is also how you can tell, like the litmus test for if you're actually dealing with ascended masters. Ascended masters always want you to be empowered. They want you to take credit for the good things that you do. They do not want to be worshiped. They want you to feel that you are a special and you know important person and the equal to anyone. So, and they've made certain, they were saying, these are not assignments, even though I sometimes joke, they're my cosmic assignments. They're like, these are opportunities, not burdens. And these are things that you can do. And really we are just helping to connect the dots and show you what's already inside of yourself. So this is a pretty important distinction to make because these are not overlords you know, beings who would like to have you underneath their thumb and they could squash you down and crush you in an instant. Totally different vibe. So got a great inspiration for a sculpture, 
contacted some of the ascended masters who are um, musicians or they contacted me and I will be doing some collaborating with some of these wonderful ascended musicians and then so this is like the just to give you the tone of what I experienced before I even went to the mountain and then the next morning I went very early and drove to the mountain and I parked kind of halfway up so that I could still see the face of the mountain, which is very white and covered in snow, but I parked where there's not that much snow. And I had warm clothing and was prepared to be cold. And it was cold, it was 33 degrees. And when I got out of my car, I was like, I'm gonna do my little ritual. I was gonna burn, you know, some sage and I brought my crystal ball with me and, um, you know, vaporized some cannabis. And it was very cold and I said, I am going to get in the car and do my little ritual and connect the spirit from a place of being comfortable. So I had my window cracked open a little tiny bit and I burned sage and I vaporized cannabis and had a lovely um, experience talking with the mountain, having a conversation. And at a certain point I was cold, so I toggled the little button to pull up my electric window of my car. And a moment after I did that, I looked down at the dashboard and I realized that the keys were not actually in the ignition when I did that. So that was a magical occurrence. And I recognized it at the moment that it happened. And when I, by the time I got up to the mountain, I had left my internal dialogue behind. I had done all of my um, crying and complaining and um, unhappiness because this is like, this is like when you go home, when you haven't been home for a long time. And like the, sometimes the first things that come out are all the bad things, the worst things. Like, you know, you hug and you're like, you'll never believe all the bad things that happened to me. I had this and this and this. And it's like, that's the, the first stuff, but it's not always the most important stuff. So we let all of that stuff out. And then by the time I was just on the mountain, there was just clarity. There was just me connecting to consciousness. And in that mental state, it's first of all, it's a powerful manifestation portal just to be on that area of the surface of Earth and then to be in a clear mental state. The teaching for me what in the experience was this is how we are going to begin to transition into a world that is a pure manifestation of mind. So right now we are in a world that is already a pure manifestation of mind. The mind that it is manifesting from has the belief system of objective materialism. Rational skepticism is part of this objective materialism. The mind needs a story that tells us how it got there. You know, if I have a bottle of water sitting on my table, I need to know how did this come into existence? Who manufactured this? What's the truck that drove it there? How, who is the for physical corporeal human being that actually placed it on my table? This is all the necessary cosmic narrative structure so that we will believe and accept something. And my conscious mind was temporarily fooled. We never forget anything and we always know where everything is. And I consciously forgot that I didn't have the keys in the ignition, but my higher self knew that the keys were not in the ignition. This was all a ruse or a, um, an act that was designed to enlighten my rational, skeptical, materialistic, you know, observer mind. The mind at the level of yellow, okay? We're not talking about insight, we're talking about solar plexus, we're talking about the conscious mind, the mind that humanity has been programmed with. That mind has trouble believing in magic, which would be, as Arthur C. Clarke describes it, any sufficiently sophisticated technology. You know, if we looked at my iPad or, you know, I'm looking for a phone or whatever, that would be considered magic to a technology, technological advancement of the past hundred years, you know, if you went back in time, that might be considered magic. Um, so my mind needed uh, something that, a narrative structure that could explain how the window could go up. And when I was driving back from this experience, my mind even tried to backslide and tried to say, oh, that the keys were probably in the ignition the whole time. And I watched my mind do this. And I said to my mind, no, I know what I perceived. And I perceived that the keys were not in the ignition and the window went up anyway. 
These are important things because our vision of reality is malleable. This is like after a car accident or after a crime, you ask witnesses and eyewitnesses will describe different experiences even though they witnessed the same exact experience. So our minds and our perceptions are malleable. And part of controlling reality and making this transition is utilizing that, but not being, don't be played by your mind because my mind tried to rewrite the story of what had happened. So I stood firm in my assertion. And I have another little version of this story. So I had prepared a little round container, like a little plastic container full of special buds from my garden that I was of cannabis that I was going to vaporize on my little ritual there. And I prepared it in the morning before I drove up there. And when I opened up the little plastic container to put the herb into my apparatus, I noticed that there was a seed in the container. And there wasn't one in the morning when I prepared that because I value my seeds very much so I can grow them in my garden. I would not have overlooked that. So that seed magically materialized into that little container when I was up there on the mountain. And there was plausible deniability to my rational skeptical mind. The seed didn't just materialize into my hand or just fall in my lap. My mind would not have been able to believe in that event and uphold it and make it happen. My mind could believe in the structure of the event that there was a seed in the little container of plant material and that maybe was forgotten from the morning. These little windows of opportunity are what allow our mind to actually believe. So when I am talking about making this transition to a world, we're coming from the world of objective materialism and we are going to the world of pure fantasy and pure imagination. You know, like Willy Wonka, the world of pure imagination. This is a world where whatever is up here is instantly manifest. And the limiting factor in the experiment right now is the power of belief. That if you cannot believe in the existence or presence of an object, if there's no integument to tie that object to reality, your belief system has difficulty in actually upholding that object. So, and when you find an object, your belief system creates a convenient narrative structure to describe how it ended up being there. So if I found a bottle of water, you know, lying in the driveway, I would make up a story that said, a factory made the plastic, a factory made the juice inside, maybe a truck drove by and it fell off the truck and rolled into my driveway. I'd make up an elaborate story about how it got there. I probably would not make up a story that said an interdimensional portal opened up and a bottle of water fell through that portal into my driveway so that I would find it at that exact moment. And yet that is in equally valid narrative structure to explain the presence of an object in reality. So we are moving into this new era, this new time on the surface of Earth, where we will be reclaiming the capacity to create directly from our mind. And in order to do so, we need to have these transitionary programs. You know, the capacity to eat sunlight, and we'll get into that with the level one material, is a mental program. The way you learn how to do it is not just by doing it, not just like, you know, doing an exercise blindly like this. It is by getting the mental program and actually understanding it. All right. So when I was on Mount Shasta, I was also asked by the Agartans. Let's talk about Agartha. It is a soft H. Like imagine saying ha, but ah, Agartha. And it actually is more like translating like from the place of Garta. And the Agartan civilization refers to all of the beings that are this last remnant, this last vestige of the antediluvian worldwide sophisticated planetary culture that was known as Atlantis and was an outgrowth of Lemuria. So when Atlantis was being degraded, and Atlantis, just like ancient Egypt, went through different eras, like there was 
high Atlantis and then it became degraded and devolved and then there was the Atlantis of slavery and then Atlantis fell, all right? So beings from the time of high Atlantis perceived what was going on and they saw that there was this cultural and energetic and genetic invasion of consciousness that was occurring and they um, created a, I want to say they sequestered themselves. They removed themselves to a um, protected place, a protected zone, and created a shield around that zone. Because, you know, I've been teaching you all about how during your day you have a, a mind that is installed, you have this verbalized operating system that is a hacked operating system and that it allows these negative lower vibrational service to self thought entities to go inside of your mind and do whatever they want so that they can get you to emit negative emotions well those lower vibrational service to self negative thought entities can't get through the agartan shield they made a shield it is upheld by several guardians Guardians are consciousness warriors, all right? So imagine like someone who is like a musician and their job is just to sing a note and just keep that note going for an eon, for thousands of years. And everyone knows that they can calibrate to that note. And these are what these consciousness warriors are doing. They're upholding the shield that um, prevents satanic or um, those you know consciousness entities that feed off of negativity from negatively affecting the culture from farming them for culture so the agartans are what humans in atlantis were and they are what the potential of humanity remains we or earth surface humans can become like the agartans the Agartans, when I was driving to Mount Shasta, were very tuned in to my neurology and they were looking at the world through my eyes and experiencing things through my perception. And I taught them a lot about Earth's surface human culture. I've been like a cultural envoy, like teaching them about jobs and highway road crews and why we have roads and why we have cars and of course they understand this but it's very different to read something in a textbook than it is to speak to an actual inhabitant of that world so i ah so mike has a question he says agartha is not physical to us this is an excellent question so agartha is there's an overlap all right agartha is actually a non-physical realm it is a realm that you can enter into with your consciousness, your non-physical body, and only with your physical matter if it's vibrating at the right rate. The lock on the door or the shield is an energetic shield. It's vibrating at a certain rate, and if you're not vibrating at that right rate, you can't get through. But if you're vibrating at the right frequency, then what appears to be a solid wall is something that you can move through very easily. So when you go to Shasta, there's the physical mountain that you can see with your physical eyes. Then there's the non-physical aspect of the city that you can see with your inner eye. And the physical mountain is often shrouded by mist, clouds, and these little sparkling snow squalls. When I was on the mountain itself, sometimes these sparkling crystals fly on by and I understood that that is part of the cloaking mechanism water itself is programmable with consciousness we know this from Dr. Emoto the snowflake crystals when you say I love you and um, the water that surrounds Mount Shasta has been programmed and it is programmed to be a veil like a curtain in between the realm of physical matter and this realm of non-physical matter. People who are programmed with objective materialistic programming and they think, I only believe in what I can see with my physical eyes, I only believe in the world that I can touch with my five senses, those people literally cannot enter into Agartha because they don't have the consciousness program to get in. We, this is how we can understand like the mythological tales from the Far East of Shangri-La or Shambhala. So in the Far East, 
the city is hid, hidden underneath one of the mountains of the Himalayas or the Himalayas. And seekers, you know, spiritual aspirants, sometimes would wander in the high up frozen regions of the Himalayas looking for Shangri-La. Sometimes they were frozen to death because they didn't understand it's not a realm that you enter into by taking a shovel and digging a hole or a bulldozer and bulldozing your way down into the ground. You enter in by raising your vibration, ascending. And this is the level two stuff. So we'll get into, I'll take the second half hour to speak about becoming an ascended master and the I am God circuit. But the, that was my long answer. The short answer is Agartha is a non-physical place or Agartha is the non-physical civilization. And there are various cities associated with that. So one is Telos, T-E-L-O-S, that is associated with Shasta. And then there's Shambhala or Shangri-La that is associated with the High Himalayas. And they're um, basically, these are the chakras of the earth, the chakras of Gaia, the woman. And these magical manifestation centers align with her energetic anatomy. So the Agartans keep alive the values of true humans, values of non-competitiveness and mutual respect and appreciation of your skills and talents and ability to uh, contribute to the whole. Um, the value system of me, 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 I take it all, it's all for me, me first and me over you is totally not respected by their culture. And if you went to their culture and acted in that way, it would be like if you walked around town picking your nose or burping or farting or doing something totally inappropriate. You know, they would look down on you like, oh, aren't you egotistical and competitive? You know, like, oh, you just laid a big smelly fart. And it's true um, because it shows that there is a lack of cultivation you know, if you fart in public, it shows you don't even have control over your first chakra, your very base chakra. And this is when we are interacting with the Agartans, it is necessary to mitigate one's ego and bring consciousness to the level of unconditional love. And if you're still working with the whole fear-based competition premise, it shows that you have not yet made it to this level of unconditional love and you need more work and refinement. So the whole premise is that the Agartans have been a network of telepathic ascended masters keeping alive this tone and this vibration during the past, let's say, roughly 15,000 years, which is not that long in the overarching history of the planet. It's just been a little tiny burp, but that is all of what Earth's surface human culture represents as all of human history. And it doesn't even know the story of what happened previous to 10,000 years, you know, before the Ice Age, really only looks to the past 5,000 years, you know, with archaeological evidence and evidence of actual culture. So Earth's surface is an amnesiac culture that is afflicted by satanic entities that farm you for negativity. And the Agartans, or quote unquote, inner earth culture, have kept alive the true values of compassion, um, collaboration, and divine co-creative partnership. And the ascended masters absolutely are helping beings who have not yet ascended. Like if you're still in the corporeal realm, you haven't ascended yet, but, and you might be a master. You might be in the process of mastering your mind. So let's, I'm going to start the recording in the background and I'm going to get into the I am God circuit. And I'm going to tell you all about what, what is it when we become an ascended master? So the first thing I have to do is I have to draw my traditional at this point, time vortex and i've shown you what that is many times there you go you can see it a little bit better now that i leaned out of the screen but right down there time vortex with this central timeline going to infinity that's what that lazy eight symbol is and that time vortex is analogous to it that is a 
flat line drawing that is actually a cross section of this, which is a three dimensional time vortex. So you can now see this bottom edge here is rounded. Here I've drawn it as flat. And this is actually a curved surface that you can't even see in that picture. This is like the analog record, like an old fashioned record that you put on a record player where the needle starts around the edge and spirals in towards the middle. And in a record, this is a song of music. In your life, it is the song of your life. These are all of the possibilities and probabilities of your corporeal existence. And all of them, every single one of them, ends or terminates in death, except for the one that goes through this little tiny wormhole. So here in the sculpture, you can see where my pointer is kind of going in there. I'll get to that question in a second. On the drawing up here, I'm pointing with the shadow. It's right up there. That little wormhole right there is the singularity, and it is our source and our destination. Question on the chat. Is there a possibility that some of us might be able to get into Agartha in this lifetime? Not only is there a possibility, the answer is yes. Every single one of us has one of these central core timelines. So this is, when I draw these pictures, this is a gra it's kind of like math. It is a non-anthropomorphic empirical sharing of information that can be applied to everyone. So one plus one is two is true across the board. This time vortex is the same shape for everyone. You, me, Charles Manson, and Jesus Christ have the same shaped time vortex. So what that means is that the Charles Manson that you and I are probably most familiar with is one of these outliers. He is one of these peripheral uh, beings over here. He's not actually in alignment with the central core timeline because on that core timeline, we are embodying the um, uh, value system of unconditional love. And rampant mass murder does not embody the value system of unconditional love. So we know that Manson is on one of the peripheral timelines. But we also know that because he's got a time vortex shaped like this, he also has an ascended master timeline. Everybody does. The worst mass murderers, Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, the worst of the worst, all have an ascended master timeline. So too do the most mediocre of the most mediocre. Think about J average Joe, ye old Joe, you know? All of those ordinary Janes and Joes also have an ascended master timeline. And they're not bad. Mediocre people are not bad, but they're not perfect. And when you are an ascended master, what that means is that you have cultivated your mind like the way an Olympic athlete has cultivated their body. You can do a lot of great things in, in, with your body that, you know, you might not be at the level of a, an Olympic athlete. Like you can go for a walk in the park. You might not be able to run 26 miles, but you're still a good person. You can be a mediocre person and you're still a good person, but you're not an ascended or ascending master. And the the value of this, why cultivate yourself to be an ascended master, is because when you get to this wormhole here, when you get to this little wormhole to exit the vortex, you don't just go back to source, you actually get up to the next level or the next quantum. So when we talk, let me make a little bit of space here, when we talk about a quantum, because this is such a catchword in the quote unquote new age community, this dot is a nucleus. This is the line drawing cross section of an electron shell that's actually a sphere. And then here's another electron shell that's actually a sphere around it. So this is science talk here. The nucleus that I'm pointing at right here is inside of the atom. And this shell right here represents where an electron might be. 
So because this is what happens when we get down to super tiny, tiny things. At the level of our physical eyes, we can say, the sculpture is here. And we can look at it and point at it and we know where it is and how fast it's moving. But at the tiny subatomic level, strange things start to happen when we look at things. This is the problem of observership. If you talk to anybody who's heavy into the scientific, objective, materialistic, rationalist, skeptic, skeptic mindset, um, all you have to do to puncture their belief system is say, what about the problem of observership? And this is displayed in the double slit experiment or the thought experiment of Schrodinger's cat. It's also known as the uncertainty principle or the problem of observership. And it states basically that just the act of looking at something at a subatomic level changes it. So that's a very long winded way with many flapping of my moving mouth parts to tell you that we can't say exactly where an electron is because as soon as we look at it, it changes. So we can only give an estimation of the neighborhood. We know roughly where it is. So that's called an electron shell. And that is this right over here. That's the neighborhood where an electron might live. But we can't say that it's exactly right there in that spot or exactly right there in that spot because it is constantly hopping in and out of reality and it's occupying that entire shell at once. Keep that in mind. I'm drawing a picture here. Keep that in mind. So imagine a spherical shell that is where a particle of consciousness occupies and it's occupying all of those different possibilities. The quantum leap happens when this, I'm making a giant exaggerated red dot there in that first shell, jumps up to the next shell where I have just drawn a super exaggerated blue dot. That journey is not a linear journey. For example, the little red dot here does not jump in its spaceship or jump in its car or its helicopter and fly across the gap in order to get up there. The quantum leap is an energetic leap and a consciousness leap. So there's no one and a half. There's only one or two, right? Like this is position one and this is position two. There's no one and a half. There's no increment in between position one and position two. So the way you get from position one to position two is by adding energy. This is science, man. When you add energy to an electron, it gets energy, 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 energy. And at a certain point when it has enough energy, it jumps up to the next shell, but it does not occupy this area in between. It just jumps directly to the next level. That is what happens when you exit the wormhole. So now let me go back to this so that you, and this is a picture of a galaxy that is also shaped like a torus, which is why I have that up there. When you, uh, with your red time spiral, spiral all the way up your time vortex and make it to that wormhole up here, you become an ascended master and you jump to the next level of the electron shell. So I tend to draw that as another time vortex sticking out like that, you know, with a another, the next subtle layer of, sorry, of, there we go, refinement to happen. So when you complete this level of incarnation and you ascend, that's not the end of your journey. You then have the next realm within which to become refined or the next level of finesse to understand. Um, so the Agartans occupy the next highest electron shell. And each one of us has exactly one timeline that will bring us to that higher dimensional state. We have a timeline no matter what, no matter if you are the shittiest person or the most saintly person, you have exactly one timeline. And it is absolutely inevitable that you will reach that timeline. It's just like saying, your glasses are always in the last place you looked for them because after you found them, you didn't have to look any further. If this is 
the time spiral of your life. This is the song of your life. You're experiencing every single possible iteration until finally you hit that wormhole. And that is the last iteration you have to do. It is the last experiment within this realm that you have to make. So each person on their path of least likelihood, on their ascended master timeline, in becoming an ascended master, in order to do this, um, and this will relate to uh, the teachings about longevity, what you have to do is have a mental program. It's not just about eating substances that give you long life um, or surrounding yourself with a context that will give you long life. You must think about the possibility of a magical or supernatural or technological um, tool or experience that will bring you to this ascended state. So here are some examples. The these are examples from different cultures and different times. Bathing in the fountain of youth. Um, technological nanobots that restructure your body on every level. Um, being directly connected to the sun, creating a, uh, uh, a sense of uh, total cellular renewal. Like any one of these things and anything else, how about um, going to the fairy realm and having fairies magically fix your body, um, going to Agartha and being healed in crystal light chambers. Any of these things, these are like narrative structures that give your rational mind some integument to tie your present circumstance to the future circumstance that you'd like to be experiencing. Your future circumstance is one of extended life and total vitality. How do you get from here, who you are in this time and place, to there? So the answers from the past were, I found the fountain of youth and I bathed in that fountain and then ever afterwards I was, you know, how about being saved, being baptized? How about eating a magical substance like monoatomic gold? The, it, the, it is arbitrary. The thing or activity itself is a ruse. What matters is that you contain a mental program that opens the door for immortality, that opens the door for cellular renewal, and that opens the door for you to make it to the to this next level. So I also, some of the information I didn't get to last week, and it's, it's a good homework episode that's worth watching, it is called the I Am God Circuit. And this is why I call it the I Am God Circuit and why I have the picture of the galaxy up here. So first of all, let me highlight on the galaxy, you can see that we have a Taurus. These giant purple clouds don't actually exist. They were added in. We, if we looked at uh, this galaxy with the telescope, we wouldn't see giant purple clouds. Those are in a spectrum that is beyond what our physical eyes can see. So that has been added in by an artistic scientist in order to show that there is energy there. So the like we're looking at a galaxy, a galaxy is usually shaped like a dinner plate, but we're looking at it edge on. And you can see these giant purple bubbles that stick up and down that creates the vortex, that creates this lovely hourglass shape. So essentially, a galaxy is half of one of these, all right? And I'm drawing like the arms of the galaxy so that you can see like these are all stellar arms of the galaxy. Hold on one second while I drink a little water. And I also collect my thoughts when I drink water because I have so many things that I want to say. I have to get all these things out in the next 15 minutes. Okay, so the galaxy is comprised of, like our friend Carl Sagan used to say, billions and billions of stars. And each one of these individual stars is, you know, like the neurons that we have in our brain. Let me draw some neurons here. 
this is a total simplification of what is happening at the tiny level, microscopic level inside of your brain. But this is known as the synaptic gap. I'm highlighting it here in black so that you can see what I'm talking about. But each one of those little knobs that I've drawn is a nerve ending. So an impulse comes from your arm all the way down to the nerve ending, and then it has to hop across that little synaptic gap to get to the other nerve ending. And the hop that it makes is a chemical hop, all right? So I know that people think about this in terms of like a spark plug, or they think of it like electricity. You know, you think you have electrical signals going through your brain and then it looks like some kind of, you know, little sparks are happening. They're actually chemical messengers, so it's not actual sparks. And I also get into this with the endocannabinoid system and how this is not just a one-way circuit. For many years, science thought this was only a one-way circuit with uh, everything flowing downstream. So if this is the, the neuron that I just drew a red line above, if that is the upstream neuron, the scientific understanding was that everything flew downstream and then continued onward. You can see I just did a little impulse jumping from here to here and then moving onward. But actually, with the endocannabinoid system, we now know that energy signals are regulated in the opposite direction too. We'll get more into that on another class. But what I wanted to share in this idea is this concept of having to make that little leap and the way that that leap occurs. And that little leap of a thought impulse from one uh, nerve ending to another nerve ending is analogous to the leap of going from, gotta draw my little pictures again, going from a lower electron shell up to a higher electron shell, all right, and also going from one of these time vortexes at this scale and going into one of the smaller time vortexes like this scale. So I am trying to draw an analogy here that we are living within a great brain. And just like your brain, this great brain has tons and tons of activity all the time. When you make the ascended master timeline, when you finally get all the way up to that lovely wormhole, you know, I'm making a big giant black mark up there. When you get to that big giant black mark up there, it is analogous to this little nerve impulse going from here and jumping to the other nerve ending. So your whole entire time vortex of your corporeal existence, these are all the peripheral experiences where you died or, you know, hardly got to live at all. Here you made it to age one. Here you made it to age two. These are all of the accumulated deaths, epic, that you had to go through, the song of your life, in order to finally make it to that one wormhole and be, make it to that one timeline that is in alignment with the central wormhole. So we're talking chronologically, this is a record that might take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years to go through. When you finally make that culmination, that is analogous to this one little spark of consciousness making that leap across the synaptic cleft. You are a impulse, a neuron, a neurolo let me start again. You are a neurological impulse within the mind of God. And when you achieve ascended mastery, the thought that God is having is, I am God. In that moment that you ascend and that you make that connection to source, you will think, I am God. And you will be part of a much larger entity that is also a brain, that is also thinking a thought in that moment that is saying, I am God. And 
We're not the only neuron that is firing in that brain at that moment. Many, many other neurons are firing at the same time. These are all of the other ascended masters who are also saying that. My computer's doing strange things, but it's not kicking me off, but I think I'm doing pretty good so far. You must excuse me if I get kicked off. Um, and I have actually a few more moments left on level two. I want to open the floor to any questions or comments about Ascended Mastery. And I see my computer connection's getting a little bit unstable. I, I got in touch with Zoom. I got in touch with the company. I hope that this will hold steady for us for the next hour. Um, questions, so far. questions or comments or anything that I can clarify about the process of becoming an Ascended Master and where, where we are all headed with this. We will eventually recombine Earth surface culture with inner Earth or higher Earth or, you know, the Agartan culture. We are going to be recombining. Um, that's, you know, in the near future. And this is also um, a type of combination that is like flying rainbow lasagna. You know, we don't have to cut the membrane of the bubble in order to combine the inside and the outside. So when I talk about combining Earth's surface human culture with the Agartan culture, it will be more of an uh, boundarylessness kind of combination. Um, and you can ask questions, you know, how are babies born in Agartha? Yes, not the same way that babies are born on Earth's surface. It's the question is, how are new ascended masters born? And the answer is, when you cultivate your mind and make it all the way up to this wormhole, and then you get into Agartha, that, and you have that I am God circuit moment, that is how babies are born in Agartha. And babies might not look like little tiny pink squirming infants, they might look like, you know, a two-armed, two-legged, adult-sized corporeal human, but they are chronologically new to that world. Well, anyway, so I will tell you this also, that uh, in terms of energetic tone, oh, there's a good question. The, ener the uh, energetic tone of the Agartans is very loving, very lighthearted, uh, non-confrontational, non-competitive. They don't blame, they don't point the finger. They are simply interested in cultivating you to your highest potential. The question from Mike is, when we connect with Agartha, will we have to go to Mount Shasta to do that? The answer is no, you do not have to go physically to Mount Shasta to do that. And I didn't have to go physically to do that. When I was here uh, last September, September 21st, I was planning on going to Mount Shasta and there was a forest fire in the area and a landslide, which both made me feel that I, it was not right for me to go, you know, you know, it, physically there. So I sat out in my backyard and I had a wonderful telepathic connection with the Agartans from hundreds of miles away. So the answer is telepathy is non-local. You can talk to someone telepathically five, five miles away, five feet away, or 500 million miles away with equal ease. And going to Mount Shasta was more for my own rational skeptical mind. Going to the actual mountain and feeling like I could hear them even more, you know, more closely was really for my rational skeptical mind, which thinks, oh, I have to be physically present. But I also understood that once you go and you tune in, it's like um, your Wi-Fi gets connected. It's like your Bluetooth gets connected. You don't have to go back there physically. Like I brought my large crystal sphere and she soaked up lots of energy and is connected to the uh, ascended masters of Mount Shasta. So I can, she's sitting right here on my work table. And so that powerful energetic presence was recorded in my crystal and is being, you know, I'm being bathed in that presence all the time. So the short answer after the long answer is, don't get stuck in literalism. It is not necessary to physically go in order to um, contact these beings. And they are very happy to contact us also in the dream state or the non-physical, you know, higher waking state. Um, 
Oh, this is from uh, Lucy. She says, I have amazing music from them that I will try and find the links to share with everyone. I used to listen all the time and they touch the heart. I would love to hear some music from Agartha. And I've been learning much more about the power of vibration for healing and renewing the cellular structure and have been doing that for my own. I mean, I didn't share a lot of what I went to Mount Shasta to experience was physical healing, literally a physical healing of the um, neurological and uh, blood vessel issues that I have in my brain. And a lot of the healing has been done through vibration, through tones, through listening to binaural beats at 528 hertz, or, um, you know, sometimes I just hear those tones now. I don't even have to put on the actual healing music. I just hear it. And also experiencing it in nature. So I'm going I'm going to end the recording in the background and save that and open this is April 8th. Open the floor to any other questions or comments. Okay. 